right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science to kids around the world. And of course, you guys are all stuck at home right now, so thank you so much to anyone tuning in on YouTube. We really appreciate you joining. Over the next weeks and months, we'll be doing many sessions daily, no registration, no sign-up required, and free for all involved. Now, we've been doing sessions with paleontologists and, and aquariums and zoos over the last few days. Today's is a very, very different thing. So today we are doing our very first session with John Donahue. So he is a quantum physicist and science communicator from the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. And so today he's going to be walking us through a little bit of quantum physics and the science of light with some talks, some demos, and more. We are so excited to have him for the very first time. And so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, John, and take it away. All right. Thank you so much for the intro, Jesse, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is John Donahue, and I am in physics. So I got into physics when I was in high school, um, and it's just kind of a magic thing there. Like, I, I didn't think uh, when I was in high school, like, yeah, I'm going to be a physicist. That wasn't something that I thought about, you know, in grade nine. That was something that I just kind of kind of accidented my way into in grade 12, partially because I had a really good physics teacher in grade 12. And partially because I just liked that it was a way that you could actually apply math and get some like real results out of it. Didn't really go into it thinking about careers when it because I found it to be a really, really fun subject. And that just kind of blossomed from there. Uh, what really caught my attention when I got really into physics was light, just how light works, what light is. Partially, um, so I went to the University of Windsor for my undergraduate, did a lot of co-op research terms. That's where you spend four months in different places doing different kinds of research. I always recommend when people are finding their way out in science, just try a whole bunch of different stuff. Because what I found was that when I was doing something like theoretical quantum control or nuclear magnetic resonance or something like ion trapping, there were things about all of those that I just could not wrap my head around that I didn't you know, enjoy doing. But what I really enjoyed doing in all of them was working with light, playing with light, thinking about light, and just what light is, how all the different ways that we use the light. So through all this, I got really into physics, got really into quantum physics and really got into just what light is, which I guess brings us to like the first natural question, just like what is light? So, you know, we think about light, it's what surrounds us, what helps us see. We see light that goes into our eyes and that gives us images. We're able to navigate the world based on that. But, you know, if I'm thinking about it as a physicist, what is light? Um, in physics, we're not often just looking uh, you know, to describe something at a deep level. We're not just looking to describe it at a deep level. We're often looking to find what is light like? What, is beha what does light behave? Does light behave like something else that we already know how to describe? So uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to go through a couple different ways uh, how physicists have learned to describe light, how physicists have drawn analogies between light and other different physical systems, and kind of where we're at now in terms of how we're actually working with and using light. Uh, but in terms of why I got really into light, like what about light really works for me? Well, I'm an experimental physicist. So that means that I work in the lab, I devise experiments, and I use them to try to predict something about the world which when you're dealing with light basically means that you're working with a bunch of giant Lego blocks. So what we have in all these kind of pictures, so these are pictures from labs and many of which I've worked in, many of which other researchers uh, in Canada have worked in, where what we're basically doing is we're starting off with a big, bright, shiny, kind of dangerous laser, uh, and we're just bouncing it off mirrors, we're throwing it through different kinds of crystals, we're throwing it into different kinds of materials, different kinds of gases, different kinds of uh, like light tubes, we'll see some of that later on. Uh, and we're just kind of seeing what happens there. So what I like about this is that you're just kind of like building your own setup. You have this giant thing of connects or Lego that you're using to build this giant optical setup. Uh, and you know, it becomes like, becomes your little baby, becomes your little project. Uh, and yeah, so that's one thing. One thing is just thinking about just what light is, but another thing is just like, that's, it's fun to build stuff. So I really like the hands-on aspect of light science, especially modern light science. So yeah, as mentioned, we're going to talk about what light is, what how physicists think about light. First, we'll talk a bit about the wave nature of light, how light behaves like a wave. Then we'll dip into how light behaves like a particle. And that's where we start talking a bit about quantum physics. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk a bit about how we encode information of light, how we manipulate light, how we use light in kind of modern quantum technologies. And then uh, 
open it up to questions. So first off, the wave nature of light. So what is a wave? So when we talk about light as a wave, we should probably first say, what do we mean when we talk about a wave? Well, a wave is, for all intents and purposes, something that goes up and down. It's defined by two things, the amplitude, which is how strong it is, how high the wave is, if you want, and the wavelength, which is how long it takes to go from all the way up to all the way down, from crest to trough and back to crest. Another important factor about waves is that they interfere. If I have two different waves and they crash into each other, they will exhibit interference. So for example, if I have two waves and they're both going up and down together, center myself a bit, if they're both going up and down together like this, then if they meet, they'll constructively interfere and make an even bigger wave. However, if I have two waves that are what we call out of phase, say one's going up while the other one's going down, if they meet, they destructively interfere and cancel each other out. We can see this kind of naturally in water waves. Think about what happens when you throw a pebble into a lake. When you throw a pebble into a lake, it spreads out, creating waves and ripples that expand. Now then, think about what would happen if I threw two pebbles into the lake, kind of just a little bit, uh, a little bit distant from each other, as we can see in this second image here. So when those two pebbles, ex when those, sorry, when those two ripples expand into each other, at certain times, they'll be going up and down, or at certain locations, they'll be going up and down at the same, uh, at the same phase, at the same time, and we'll see constructive interference. So at these points that we see in this picture here, we get an even bigger wave than we would have had if we just had one wave or the other. However, at certain other times, one wave's going up while the other one's going down, and we see these bands here. And here, there's no wave, there's no up and down motion to the water, we see destructive interference instead. So, yeah, so this is what we see when we look at water waves. So if we wanna see if light behaves like a wave, we should be able to see things that look reasonably like this, where we see constructive and destructive interference. So light exhibits a similar feature to water waves in that when I shine light through a small hole, through a narrow opening, much like when I throw a pebble as a dot into a pond, it actually spreads out. So if I shine a laser beam through a tiny hole, it'll get larger. So the question that Thomas Young asked in 1801 roughly was what happens if I shine light through two narrow openings and let those two spread into each other? Do I see just a larger clump of light on the other end of the wall or do I see something like this wave interference? So we actually have a setup for that right here. Oh, ah, spoilers. <laughs> All right, so uh, what I have here is this little card right here. So this here is actually is actually just something that we print using a transparency and a laser printer. So any teachers out there, you can easily do this in the class. Probably already do. Already do. Uh, and it's really hard to see on the camera, but on this top one, there are actually two narrow slits right beside each other, one next to the other. And you know, it's a much smaller, much smaller than the laser beam. So if I shine my laser beam through it it will actually go through both slits. Let's move the camera around a bit. We see over here that we just have our laser beam and right here we have that slit card mounted. And we're gonna shine that laser through this slit and see the pattern on the wall. And if we look at what we see, we see exactly that kind of wave interference. We see here some constructive interference that's brighter than it would have been if it was just one slit. And we see these dark bands here. That's the destructive interference where light from one slit uh, meets up with light from the other slit out of phase and they destructively interfere. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So this was Thomas Young's double slit experiment. And what it showed us was that light behaves like a wave. This kind of, you know, put, this kind of put, the, put it to rest for a while. People are like pretty happy with this. Light is definitely behaving. It's like a wave that gives us constructive and destructive interference. So we can model light as if it is a wave. The natural question to ask after that is, okay, if light's a wave, what's actually waving? Uh, and it turns out that it's, um, light is what we call an electromagnetic wave. We can see this with how light interacts with uh, things like electrons. It actually carries around an electric field that can cause uh, tiny particles like electrons to oscillate up and down. So if I think about what an electric field does, it attracts charges. This is a very, very quickly 
oscillating or very, very quickly changing magnetic field. So if I'm a beam of light and I'm traveling towards you, I'm, I'm carrying around an electric field with me. Uh, I'm traveling in this direction. I have an electric field that could be going up and down like this. And I'm also carrying a small magnetic field that's going side to side like this. But that's not the only direction that the electric field can wiggle. Uh, light carries a property called polarization. Uh, and light can, in principle, uh, have an electric field that goes in any direction. So in any direction that's perpendicular to the beam. So if I'm a beam of light traveling towards you this way, I could have an electric field going up and down like this, side to side like this, diagonally like this. I could even have one that kind of twists around in a circle. Normally you don't see this. There are two, there, there's always kind of an alphabet of polarizations. We always have a, like a binary alphabet of polarizations. But there are certain materials that you have, some around your house, some more scientific materials that are sensitive to polarization. What we have here is something called a polarizer. So it's a little sheet and all it does is it absorbs light depending on its polarization. If, I have a, if I'm a beam of light and I'm traveling with the electric field going side to side like this, I'll travel through the polarizer no problem. But if my electric field going up and down, it'll be absorbed by the polarizer. So normally if I just hold up my polarizer to this light source and just kind of twist it around, we don't really see anything. Light from the sun is what we call unpolarized. Doesn't have a specific polarization, doesn't have a specific direction. Basically, it doesn't care. Uh, but if I take two polarizers instead, so I'm gonna take my one polarizer here and my one polarizer here, if I hold them the same way, the light travels through no problem. But if I start twisting one respect to the other, we can block one out. Yeah. Effectively, what one's doing, this light is going to absorb all the horizontal, oh, sorry, all the vertical polarization. This one's going to absorb all the horizontal polarization. At the end of the day, that leaves us with absolutely nothing left. So these are polarizing sheets, order them online, but certain things around us also exhibit polarization. If you have a pair of sunglasses that cost more than $10, they're probably also polarized. So if I hold up my pair of sunglasses at the slight source and look through as well, we can see the same effect. If I'm very careful about how I hold with the camera, which is very difficult, but there we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so sunglasses are polarized for a very, very specific reason. Oh, uh, let's just share the screen again. So sunglasses are polarized because it turns out that road glare is polarized. When light reflects off a surface, it actually picks up polarization. More of the horizontally light, more of the horizontally polarized light is reflected than the vertically polarized light. So if I wear sunglasses that have horizontal polarization, that absorb all horizontally polarized light, they'll reduce the road glare and I'll be able to see more clearly when I'm driving. That's why you want polarized sunglasses, especially if you're doing a lot of driving. Uh, but this is also very important in photography. And you can see in this picture here that by using a polarizing filter, we reduce the amount of glare coming off the surface of water and can see more clearly and you'll see more details underwater. It uses in photography to see more details clearly through glass surfaces, such as car windshields, all that kind of thing. Polarization is also used in things like 3D movies. What we have there is two perpendicular polarizers on the glasses so that uh, if I project a polarized image onto the screen, one eye will see one image, the other eye will see the other image, and that can kind of trick our brain into thinking that it's a 3D image. We can also use in these kind of material analysis things by putting materials between two cross polarizers. Uh, if these materials rotate the polarization, we can use this to find their stress points. So when I'm talking about light right now, I'm talking about light waves. I've been mostly kind of talking about it in terms of light that we can actually see with our eyes, but Turns out light's a much more broad, a much broader category than just things that we can see with our eyes. In fact, the what we call the visible spectrum really takes up just a very, very small area in terms of the all the possible kinds of light. So visible light, red light, blue light, green light, yeah, all of that is electromagnetic waves, but so are microwaves. Microwaves are also a form of light just with a much longer wavelength. The wavelength of visible light is something on the scale of 500 nanometers, uh, whereas the wavelength of microwaves is on the order of a centimeter or so. The wavelength of light that we use to transmit radio and television signals, that's on the order of a meter. The wavelength of things like x-rays is on the order of a nanometer, but they're all electromagnetic waves. We describe them all in the same way. And if I think about some an effect that happens with one type of light, usually I can come up with an analogous effect that happens for a different type of light. And as scientists, we use all we use the entire electromagnetic spectrum in very different ways. So 
I normally work with visible light. I work in the field of photonics. There we really focus on visible light or infrared light, stuff that's very close to what we can see. But if I'm working in magnetic resonance imaging, I'm actually working with radio frequency light all the time. If I'm working in uh, astronomical observations, I'm gonna be working with the whole spectrum, but some of the more expensive telescopes actually, like the Fermi telescope, work with gamma rays, those very, very high energy rays. Gamma rays and X-rays might be what I'm more interested in. If I'm into particle physics, if I'm into atomic physics, I want microwaves and radio frequency waves as well as visible light. So if I want to get into physics, into the physics of light, if I want to, you know, there's a lot of light that can be studied. So, and using these, seeing all these effects and these different regimes is part of the excitement. All right, so at this point in history, we're getting up to about 1900. Everyone's very happy with the fact that light is a wave. But then people started thinking, okay, so light's a wave. And uh, we are also very convinced that, you know, nature was made up of atoms. Atoms have electrons kind of flying around them. We hadn't quite figured out everything about that, but, you know, we had that idea. And so our next question, uh, the next one of the next questions people were asking was, why do things glow the way they glow? So if I think about why things glow, well, it turns out we, we figured out that moving charges produced radiation, but we want to figure out why different moving charges produce different colors of radiation. Uh, for example, when you turn on a toaster, it gets hot, it eventually goes, glows red hot. If I let it get even hotter by, you know, juicing it up to an even higher voltage source, I might be able to make it go white hot or it'll burn, one of the two. Uh, and uh, all the time, objects around us are glowing in different colors that we can't see. So Generally speaking, we're always kind of emitting infrared light. Even cold objects are emitting microwave and radio frequency light. But our theory of radiation didn't quite match the colors that we were getting out. In fact, if we take our naive theory of radiation from the late 1800s, it predicted that everything should always be glowing blue and ultraviolet all the time. So obviously, we're not constantly emitting blue and ultraviolet light. So this was a bit of a problem. So Max Planck came along and effectively tried to work in a little fix in the mathematics of the charge of radiation. So you usually see pictures of Max Planck now and he's like, you know, very refined, he's bald. This is what he looked like when he was about my age, uh, which, you know, it's a beautiful man. Uh, and his basic idea was what if instead of light being just a wave, light was kind of chunky. What if light was, uh, instead of being emitted like a, like a, like a wave that we think of where we can go from all the way off to like a little bit to all the way on, uh, it only was able to be emitted in packets. So he called these packets photons. Effectively, there were a mathematical fix at the start. He figured he would just say, okay, if, if we take in the math that light is made up of little chunks and then we take the size of those chunks to zero, does that change, uh, does that change the formulas we end up with? Turns out that there is actually a finite size chunk of light. So let's think about a dimmer switch for a second. If I have a dimmer switch, I can go from all the way off to all the way on and anywhere in between. So I can you know, have, it, have the light set at zero, I can have the light set at one, I can have the light set at 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever number I want. With photons, that's not the case. It turns out that if I'm actually turning up a dimmer switch on the quantum level, I can have zero photons or one photon or two photons or three photons of light, but I can never have, you know, half a photon of light or pi photons of light. They come out in these very individual bundles, these kind of particle-like things that we call photons. Now, we don't normally see this. We don't normally see light being chunky. If I, if I tell you that light is chunky, you're gonna look at me and be like, well, no, it's, I have a dimmer switch, it works. It's just because the effect is going on at such a small, small scale. So for visible light, each of these photons have, has the energy equivalent to about one billionth of a billionth of a joule. Uh, a joule is about how much energy it takes to heat up, a, heat up a gram of water by one degree Celsius. So we're talking about a very, very tiny amount of energy. If I think about a 60 watt red light bulb, it's emitting something like 20 million trillion photons per second. So in our day-to-day -day life, we're not seeing the fact that light is chunky. It's just, it's not something that's uh, visible to us in our day-to-day -day life. But it turns out, if I want to understand why a toaster glows red, I need to take into account the fact that light is chunky. So it's this very, very small thing that has very, very, very large implications to how we describe the broader world around us. This caused a lot of philosophical strife in the physics community for a long time. Um, 
because we think about waves and particles as being two different things for the most part. If I think about the energy that's carried by a water wave and the energy that's carried by a tennis ball that I throw at you, those are two very, very different things. But it turns out with light, it's both behaving like a wave in the sense that we see things like these interference experiments, but it's also behaving like a particle in the sense that we can count it. So how do we kind of uh, square these two images? So let's go back to that double slit experiment for a second and think about it as if I was sending one single photon into this double slit experiment. What that basically means is that the photon is going to go through either slit one or slit two, and then it's going to end up on the screen on the wall at the end of the day. So let's do an experiment where I send one photon at a time into the double slit experiment. Because there's one photon, it should have to pick either slit one or slit two before it ends up on my screen or camera or whatever's on the other side. So should I still see interference? There's only one photon there. What does it have to interfere with? Naively, I might think, well, it went through one slit or the other, so I should see no interference. But we can actually do this experiment. So this is, uh, we're gonna send one photon at a time. We're gonna pick it up on the camera and we're going to see if we do see this interference. So we're just gonna send one photon at a time. So this, unfortunately I can't do from my home, but thankfully we have a video uh, from some data that was taken at ITC about five years ago. And let's see what happens. So this is the spatial direction here. This is kind of the direction along the screen. And we see we're just building up one shot, one photon at a time. And we're just gonna let this run for a while until we collect. So right now it kind of looks like nothing, uh, but let's keep building, because it keeps sending photons one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And eventually some structure starts to emerge. Yeah, it's building, it's going, it's going. And as it goes, we see those exact same, that exact same interference pattern that we saw uh, with the laser beam on the wall. So even though we're sending just one photon at a time, we still see interference. So the photon is in a way kind of interfering with itself. Uh, what we would say in the quantum physics community is that the photon doesn't go through one slit or the other. It goes through a superposition of both slits. So that when I measure it on the screen, I still see interference. I'm seeing interference of the possibility of the photon going through the left slit and the possibility of the photon going through the right slit. So even though it's one particle at a time, it still can interfere with itself. So this is what we call wave particle duality. It's like a particle in that I can count it, but it's like a wave in that it still exhibits interference. Oh. And we can see this with other particles as well. So this is what we're talking about photons right now, but we can actually see this exact same thing with other things that we think about as particles. So electrons are an example. Before people were talking about photons, everyone assumed that electrons were particles. No one ever assumed that an electron was not a particle. But if I use it, if I give it a lot of momentum, I can see wave-like features in electrons. So this is an experiment, exact same experiment, except instead of sending photons, particles of light, we're gonna send electrons, individual particles of charge, and we do see interference patterns. So wave particle alley applies to the light, but it also applies to electrons. We've seen it apply to, mol to large molecules. Uh, it applies to basically everything if we think about it on a quantum physical level. All right, so what are we doing with this? This is like kind of a history of light. So what are we actually doing with light now? So one of the big topics in light science and quantum photonics right now is quantum information. So what we're doing in quantum information is we're thinking about how we process information. So let's think about what a computer does for a quick second. A computer, if I'm sitting on my computer, I'm typing into it, uh, I'm going to give it some input information. The computer is going to shake up that information and it's going to give me something useful on the screen. I'm giving it some input, it's giving me some useful output. Let's abstract that one level and think about a computer as this black box. I give it a whole bunch of binary information, all the information that I'm typing on my keyboard, I can translate that into binary. And then it's going to shake up that information and it's gonna give me some output information. The computer, what it's doing is it's processing information. A computer is an information processor. Quantum information, exact same idea, except we're changing the rules that that box obeys. So generally speaking, that box has to obey things like, um, has to obey kind of the classic laws of how we build computers, which is, you know, think about wires, think about different kinds of gates, think about different kinds of logical operations. In quantum information, we can take advantage of things like superposition, of things like entanglement, of things like measurement uncertainty, to just change the rules of what that box can do. 
this is a this is where we start getting outside of physics. This becomes more of a blend of a whole bunch of different fields. This is a blend of physics, chemistry, engineering, mathematics, computer science. It's very, very interdisciplinary. But it turns out it gives us new ways to do things like computing, if I can build new kinds of quantum computers that process information in different ways, new kinds of communication systems where instead of communicating, sending, you know, just zeros and ones to each other, we can communicate by sending superpositions or entangled states to each other uh, with implications for information security, has uh, implications on how we build new kinds of sensors, and you know, it just has implications on how we understand the world around us, kind of the foundations, the bedrock of you know, what physics is. So if I want to talk about communication for a second, it's very easy to communicate using photons. It's the same as communicating with a beam of light, except I want to send just one photon from one person to another. I can encode zeros and ones in photons using my polarizer. If I hold my polarizer like this, that's a zero. If I hold my polarizer like this, that's a one. And as we can see, when we hold two cross polarizers next to each other, we're never going to confuse the two. They're what we call orthogonal, they're perpendicular to each other. They're exclusive to each other. Uh, we can send photons by, for example, just shooting them by a laser beam from one person to another. If we don't have a clear line of sight, we can use things like optical fiber. Um, so optical fiber is like a little tube for light. So here I have just a little laser in a box and it's gonna go through my optical fiber, my light tube. So when I turn on the laser, just give it a second. Yeah, we see that little light right there. Doesn't matter how I twist this fiber beforehand, the light makes it all the way to the end. Yeah, so this is used a lot in medical imaging. Like if you ever like think about like the scopes they put in you, it's all based on fiber optics, but I can also use this to send light from one person to another to communicate information. The same way I would communicate information using like uh, electrical uh, cables underground. I can also think about shooting light up into space and sending literally even, even sometimes a single photon from the ground to a satellite in space and using that to relay information over incredibly long distances. Cool. All right, so last thing I wanna talk about is how we get light to talk to each other. So if I wanna process information, I wanna send all those zeros and ones and I wanna have them process in some way, I better be able to have ways for those zeros and ones to talk to each other. Uh, if I send in a zero and a one and I wanna know like, are these bits the same? I need some way for the zero and one to see each other. The problem with light is that it doesn't like to talk to light. So if I have a flashlight and a laser beam and I try to cross them with each other, does anything really change? Like, is there any way in which the laser beam and the flashlight interact with each other? Not really, I can pass them through. We're not talking about lightsabers, nothing bounces off each other. Light doesn't talk to light. Sometimes this is great, if I wanna communicate, I don't want my light talking to everything that's around it. But if I want to build a computer out of photons, I need my light to talk to itself. Or not talk to itself, but also talk to other beams of light. So to attack this, we're gonna, this is where we get into the field of what's called nonlinear optics. So say I have this nice little fun nonlinear crystal. This is what this little square here represents. If I send one beam of light into it, it passes through no problem. If I send a different beam of light into it, it also passes through no problem. But if I send both beams at the same time, sometimes I get a green light coming, a green laser beam coming out. So we can see that in this image here. So this is actually a video I took in the lab about a year ago. Uh, and this is me just using my hand to block one of these laser beams at a given time. And we see that when one laser is there, it's glowing a little blue just because of some other things that are happening in that system. But when both laser beams are there and only when both laser beams are there, we see it glow a bright green. So this is transforming, uh, this is making the two laser beams talk to each other. And it's also a way to generate new colors of light. Here we're taking two red beams, combining them together to make a blue beam. This gets used in a lot of different things. So if you follow the news last year in, or in 2018, this, is, uh, this field is what Donna Strickland won the Nobel Prize in Physics for. Uh, and it's essential for generating and interfacing single photons. It's essential for more than that even. If I think about like a green laser pointer, it turns out it's really difficult to make a green laser. We can't find materials or there's no cheap materials that just naturally produce green laser light. However, there are materials that naturally produce 
double the frequency, or sorry, half the frequency of green laser light, so very infrared light. So what they have in here is actually one of those nonlinear crystals here. So the laser in here is actually infrared. It goes through that nonlinear crystal and it doubles its frequency. The infrared light talks to the infrared light and we end up with this nice bright green laser beam. All right, so we talked a lot about light. We talked a lot about kind of the history of light, the theory of light, but importantly, None of this really works unless we test it in the lab. So that's what experimental physicists do. We, a lot of people, we come up with ideas about how the world works, uh, how we can make analogies between different kinds of effects to different things that we see in the real world. Um, but then we go into the lab and actually build it to test it out. So, you know, if you're thinking, hey, I have this idea and you want to know, hey, is it really how it works? Go to the laboratory once we're allowed to again. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, I'll put any questions and wash your hands. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You're the first person to say that in one of our sessions. Uh, John, that was really neat. Some of it was over my head, but that's because I need to hone up and read, but that was some fantastic stuff. And the only ever live light demo during Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we've had about 30 people tuning in the entire time from beginning to end. So we really appreciate you guys watching. And so if you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, just let me know where you're joining from, ask anything you'd like, and I'll pass along as many as we can in our, in our last 10 minutes. But I want to start with, um, just for people at home that want to learn more about this, this is a fantastic 30 minute primer. If you were keen on some books to, you know, keep the learning going for kids, for adults, for anyone, what would you recommend, John? Ah, books. Um, so there's a good one by Chad Orzel called uh, How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog. I would recommend that one. Um, and so one that touches on quantum physics, uh, but ends up touching a lot more classic of the field. If you're into physics and you just want to read a classic of physics science communication, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time is essential reading. Fantastic. I'm going to pass along, I think, Brief History of Time, everyone can find readily enough, but I'll pass the teach, How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog uh, in the chat bar for YouTube, too, so you guys can check that out. Sounds All great. right. You talked about uh, that light is way wider than just the visible light spectrum that we can see as humans. Are there animals that can see in microwave or infrared or ultraviolet or any of those things? Absolutely. So the limits of what we can see isn't determined by the light. The light doesn't decide what we're able to see. It's our eyes that determine what we're able to see. Um, and I know there's a lot of really specific examples. I know that bumblebees, for example, I'm pretty sure they see well into the infrared. Um, but essentially everyone who has a different, like even different people will have slightly different receptors. Um, yeah, changes very much depending on the geometry of the eye. Um, also, it should be noted just how sensitive our eyes really are to light. Uh, so like I said, these photons, these individual particles of light, they're small, you know, a light bulb emits something like a million trillion of them per second. But if I put you in a completely dark room and send one photon at your eye, there is evidence that human beings are capable of detecting a single photon of light. It just gets washed out and everything else. Um, there's good evidence that frogs can are decent single photon detectors. There's some evidence that humans can see one photon, there's good evidence that humans can see, you know, hundreds of photons. Uh, but yeah, our, our eyes are very neat tools, it turns out. Super cool. I um, just want to stress on the animal thing too, a lot of insects can yes, see ultraviolet. Uh, typically red flowers will be something that a bird pollinates because insects don't see as well in red. And then you have things like mantis shrimps, which can see like polar, like different levels of polarization of light and 16 different kinds of light and some really, really wild stuff. So I'm glad we got that brought up. A um, bunch of questions. So we have a person on YouTube wants to ask, can you give examples of what quantum computers might be good for? Ah, good question. Um, so a whole, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a new frontier now. So the idea of using quantum physics to compute things is only about 30 years old, which sounds like a long time, but in scientific terms is nothing. Uh, <laughs> What people originally started thinking about quantum computing for was to simulate other quantum, quantum systems. So if I think about uh, how protein folding works, or if I think about um, like how different molecular structures hold themselves together, if I want to do a simulation about how that's actually working, I need to simulate quantum physics. Regular computers, even supercomputers, are inefficient at simulating quantum physics. Effectively, I need to teach that computer quantum physics. A quantum computer, in a way, already knows quantum physics, so it can solve that problem more efficiently. Um, 
turns out that it's also good for things that you know don't like that one seems kind of like okay uh i'm building a quantum computer it's going to be better at simulating other quantum systems turns out it's also better at doing things like factoring there's evidence that it's better at doing some kinds of optimization tasks and you know we're still figuring a lot of this kind of stuff out um but there are real case scenarios especially like i said starting off with kind of the simulation and materials analysis uh fields but you know it's, it's a it's a new frontier to figure out what quantum computers could be good for we're still a long ways away from having one that is very useful for some of the tasks that we know it's going to be useful for. It's a very strong and very hard engineering challenge to get all these different electrons or all these different atoms, all these different superconducting circuits or photons, whatever we want to build it out of to interact with each other in a nice controllable way, but there's progress being made at a very quick rate. Yeah. Fantastic, John. Um, all right, we've got people tuning in from Pennsylvania, from Poland now, um, so this is exciting. Uh, <laughs> welcome in everyone. <laughs> so we're gonna try and see if we can take Three questions in about five minutes, okay, John? So that's your challenge for the day. Okay. Um, so STEM Lab, Nicole is at the P Pennsylvania State Libraries and she wants to know, are there makerspace activities that libraries can do along the lines of the things that you've been telling us today? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of kind of neat stuff that you can do using light with just what's around you right now. So one of the classic ones to do is something called polarization art. If you get a couple cross polarizers and some tape, different layers of tape will rotate polarization by different amounts. So as I put my tape between my two polarizers, I'll see kind of a rainbow effect that comes up that I can change as I layer different amounts of tape. Um, you can also do things uh, using these interference patterns. So I showed you the double slit experiment earlier. Uh, if I have a laser pointer, I can use that for a whole bunch of other things. So I can use that, for example, to measure how wide my hair is. Um, by just shining the laser beam through the hair, one, one part of the laser beam goes around the hair this way, one part of the laser beam goes around the hair the other way. Based on how wide that diffraction pattern is, I can infer how wide my hair is. So these are some you know, little activities that kind of use these effects that can be done basically with what you have lying around, assuming you have a laser pointer. Do you know if IQC or University of Waterloo have any lists of these resources that I could share online or not offhand? Uh, give me three days. Okay, send it back to me and we can, honestly, so if you send me some information, I can put it in the comment section of this video after the fact. So for anyone tuning in that wants those resources, I will absolutely share that. Sounds um, great. Fantastic. All right, we've got a uh, Mule, a first year undergrad at University of Waterloo. So hey. see, even when you're not teaching, you're teaching. Um, <laughs> They wanted to know uh, why we get the green lights specifically when we combine the two red lights. Ah, so, yeah. yeah, so conservation of energy effectively. Um, the red light, so the wavelength of light uh, determines its energy. So red light at 800 nanometers, so that's just infrared light, has an energy that's half of blue light at 400 nanometers. So uh, what the nonlinear effect does effectively is it takes Let's go back to the green case, for example. So that's 10, 1064 nanometers is the infrared light. 532 nanometers is the green light. In that nonlinear crystal, two infrared photons merge together and create one green photon. Because each infrared photon had half the energy of the green photon when they merge together, they have double the energy, they become a green photon. So energy conservation makes sure that that color turns to exactly double its color. By sending in different colors into that nonlinear crystal, I can get different colors out. Very neat. Uh, as an animal guy, I just want to stress too, uh, some of the most incredible colors in the animal kingdom are in insects, certain uh, butterflies and beetles. And it's because they're literally the, the, their skin, so to speak, has things that are exact nanometer lengths apart that reflect light in such a way that it makes them like a, a structural color, so to speak, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, John, we're going to make some money. Jacob in Poland wants to know, what is the greatest commercial potential? In quantum optics. In quantum optics? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I mean, in quantum optics, kind of the greatest commercial potential already passed us. It was in 1950, and it was when someone came up with a laser. <laughs> um, but I'd say if you want, if you really want to get into like industrialization stuff, like you can do a lot of stuff with quantum optics, quantum communication. If I want to talk about sending photons, that's huge. If I want to talk about quantum computing, there are companies like Xanadu in Toronto. Uh, who are building quantum computers out of photons. Uh, but if you want to really get into it and you want to think about it with your business hat on, I'd recommend looking at medical imaging. Uh, we use laser light a lot of time for medical diagnostics. We, we use laser light a lot for medical procedures. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of experimental research in how we 
continue to use laser and how we get better at using lasers for um, medical technology. Super cool. John, this has been so unique and great. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think our, our audience, which is quite a different audience than usual, enjoyed it too. Um, so thank you so, so much. We look forward to that list of resources. I will absolutely share that in the comments section. Uh, for anyone tuning in at home too today, again, check out our entire list of programs coming up. We've got tons of sessions coming up today um, and over the next coming weeks as you guys are all stuck at home. Um, John, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone, and talk to you.